I'm delighted that you've joined us tonight. I recognize some names from the last webinar that we did. I'm glad you're back. Um, we have a lot to learn about gardening with native plants for bees and butterflies. I'd like to introduce Brenda Neer, who will be presenting. Brenda is president of East Bee Gardeners. And Elaine Robert, Elaine is a member of our society on our board of directors, and Elaine is a master gardener in training. Ellen, say hi. Hi, everybody. Hi. I will be yeah. taking most of your questions tonight. Thank you. That's good. And then we can answer them at the end. I know you're going to enjoy learning about native plants and bees and butterflies. I think you might be in for some surprises along the way. Okay, there we go. Brenda, it's over to you. Oh, all right, great. Thank you for the introduction, Anne. I'm going to just uh, give a little information on the East Gullenberry Gardeners. We are a garden and horticultural uh, society, and normally, uh, when there's not a pandemic on, we meet on the third Tuesday of the month, uh, February to November, and we meet in Mount Albert. Everyone is welcome, it's free, and we have a speaker who talks about some sort of gardening uh, topic, and we have good snacks and some social time, and it's just a really nice evening. So hopefully some of you will join us whenever we get back to normal. Uh, for more information, you can visit our website, eastgoldenberrygardeners.com. Uh, we're on Facebook and Instagram, and we're always available to answer any of your gardening questions through our Facebook group um, or via email, okay? So let's get started. I want to thank the East Gwillenberry Library for facilitating this webinar tonight. Um, part of our mandate as a gardening society is to bring information to the community at large about gardening and environmental issues, et cetera. And, um, you know, we're kind of stifled with that right now with what's going on. So we really appreciate the library um, giving us the opportunity to continue our work in getting information out to the community. So tonight we're gonna to go over a few things. Uh, we're gonna talk about native plants, what defines native plants, why you want to do native plant gardening. Um, I'm gonna give some pictures, show you some pictures of my own native plant garden so you get some inspiration. And then I'm gonna go over some native bees and butterflies and some facts and how to create habitat and Anne's gonna jump in there as well. And then there's going to be, there is a resource page at the end, which Raymond will make available on the library uh, Facebook page as well so that uh, you can download that and have it, okay? So let's get started. First of all, a lot of people, they hear native plants and they think, um, they're weedy and maybe they lack input or impact, sorry. Um, so I'm just going to show you a few plants to dispel that kind of thought. This is oh, smart melted. Okay, so quick, quick. Um, so we've gone through that. Um, and we went through that. All right, and now we're on to the photos. Uh, this is swamp milkweed. It's a beautiful plant, a great native, uh, lo lots of impact with that. Here's some lance leaf coreopsis, uh, a beautiful, um, bright yellow, gorgeous little plant. And some beard tongue there. I kind of, sorry, I'll go back to that. Um, it's just really lagging. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. So beer tongue, hairy beer tongue, it's a beautiful sort of ethereal looking little plant um, that's a native plant. So moving forward, sometimes native plants are, uh, we get some confusion about what's native and not native. So some people will say wildflowers, and those actually refer to flowers that have naturalized in the wild, um, but they actually came in with European settlers. So things like, um, those little oxide daisies and um, um, Queen Anne's lace, that kind of thing. Native plants, um, by definition, are plants that are indigenous to, to the area and that were there before European development or um, colonization. Um, and invasive plants are plants that have come in and um, 
some of them may have um, come in when the Europeans settled here, but some have come in after that, often from unfortunately bad gardening practices or you know not really knowing about plants that that can take over and they escape from gardens and get into the wild things like phragmites that have taken over our wetlands and they tend to take over and um, at the exclusion of any other plant so when you're looking to do a native plant garden you want to think about um, how native do you want to be? Uh, it could be native to all of North America, but that's a big area, of course, and even Canada. Narrowing it down, Ontario, and even Ontario is a very large area. So something that does well and is native in Point Pelee, our southernmost tip of Ontario, is probably not going to do well or be native to somewhere like Thunder Bay. So you want to now narrow down into regions of Ontario and even into your townships. And basically the idea being that the more local the plant, uh, the better it's going to serve the pollinators in that area and they're gonna be better adapted to the climate. So finding a good resource um, that tells you where these plants are from is good. Something with a map that shows where a plant has come from and where it's endemic to is uh, very useful. So why do we want to plant native plants? Uh, mostly because pollinators, all our insects have evolved with these plants. Uh, it's shown that, that native flowers are four times more likely to attract pollinators. And even just planting a few native species will increase the diversity and numbers of wild bees in your garden. And we're also losing our native plants, our urbanization, our sprawl is taking over um, native, you know, native plant areas and we're losing those plants and bees and pollinators other pollinators really rely on these plants for survival and if we plant for the bees and the butterflies but bees in terms of pollination pollinators they're really our our best bet for uh for our crops the, the more species that visit um, a crop we get better produce from that and our, our aesthetic has been, you know, these beautiful sweeping lawn landscapes, but really this is a desert to any of our bees and, and our butterflies and other insects. There's nothing here for them. A little bit just about native plants in general. Most of them are perennial, so that means they come back every year, so that's great. You don't have to keep planting them. Uh, they're generally easy care. They don't need a lot of fertilizer and pruning and all that kind of stuff and they're hardier because they're adapted to the climate in which they're growing. But you still need to plant the right plant in the right place. Um, so if, if you take a shade plant that likes some moist woods and you try and put it in a bright, sunny, hot, dry area, it's not going to do well. So now I'm just gonna show you a little bit about my own garden, some samples of what I've done. I was really interested in native uh, bees spurred by a talk by Dr. Scott McIver at one of our EG Gardener meetings. And he was just so enthusiastic, he got me really excited. So I looked at some areas of my property that I had some neglected areas that I thought I'm gonna put a, a habitat in there. And uh, this was an old badminton court and the kids had moved out. So I moved in with my garden. and. Because it was hot and dry and sandy, I researched plants, obviously, that liked it uh, hot and dry. So I created a, a prairie or meadow type community. This is it in the very first year when everything was planted. I did add a little bit of topsoil, but not a lot. Uh, not a lot of amend amendment because I chose plants that liked poor soil and drought. Um, I put in approximately 350 plants, um, mostly native to Ontario, but I, I didn't get too strict with that. Um, mostly native to our area of Ontario, but I didn't look just specifically at, at my Durham area. Um, and I chose a multiple number of species of flowering plants so that I had different bloom times uh, to provide pollen and nectar for a range of pollinators. And I left the pathway sand and I didn't use any mulch because a lot of our native bees are ground nesting bees and I wanted to leave those areas for them. And in one short year, this is what we're looking at. So a few of the plants in this picture, we have Liatris picata here. 
Uh, echinacea, which is this purpley plant there. Most people know that one. And gray-headed coneflower is that yellow flower in the background. Uh, it's one of my favorites. Uh, looking from this direction, we have some ironweed. Oh. Not ironweed here, sneezeweed here. Uh, cylindrical liatris is this smaller plant, very dainty plant, very pretty. Uh, mountain mint is a beautiful little white flower that gets lots of pollinators on it. And this giant hyssop is really dramatic and looks quite amazing in the garden. And then I look at all seasons. You want um, stiff goldenrod is a great uh, fall season plant. And these hyssop is that purple one down in the right-hand corner. And um, all your asters, et cetera, are great for, for extending the fall season. Now, plant sources for native plants. A lot of nurseries will say they're carrying native plants. Just be careful, though. Knowing the Latin name of what you're looking for is really important, and I think it's really the only reliable way of knowing that you've got the right plant. So, and also watch for nativars. That means it's a cultivar of a native. So if it has a name after it, like Red Dawn or you know, uh, Purple Delight or something like that, it means it's mo been modified. So it's no longer the pure native plant. They've done something to it to change it. And some of those are fine, but some of them, when they do the modification to make the bloom bigger or something like that, it loses actually some of its um, beneficial properties for the pollinators. So just be careful of that. Make sure you go to somewhere reputable. Um, and never dig from wild unless it's a rescue operation. So if, you, if you're digging plants from the wild, you could disrupt that ecosystem and destroy that habitat. But if the bulldozers are coming and there's wild lupins, go in and rescue the wild lupins. And be careful, of those. there's lots of seed mixes out there that say they're wildflowers or pollinator seed mixes. A lot of the time they have non-native plants in those mixes. So again, knowing the name of your plants that are native to your area will allow you to look at those mixes and decide whether it's good for you or not. Now I'm going to do a little bit of a talk about native bees. It's really exciting. I had no idea there were so many bees in my backyard. And now that I know I'm seeing them everywhere, it's really exciting. Um, we have close to actually 400 native bees in the GTA area. They range from really tiny to quite large. 70% nest in the ground. Uh, the rest nest in old logs, hollow stems, wood, that kind of thing. They gather nectar, and the nectar they use for energy, and pollen they gather um, to feed their young. And females will consume pollen as well when they're when they're nesting um, and producing eggs because it's a good uh, protein source. Most bees, our native bees, are not aggressive because they're actually solitary nesters, so they they don't have a hive that they're protecting. Um, so they, they lay their eggs, they close the, the nest up and they leave. So they're not hanging around waiting to sting somebody because they're getting in their nest. Some of them lick your sweat, which is really cool. They're actually called sweat bees, little tiny bees. And you might see them sometimes in the summer, they land on you and you might get scared. You think they're, they're trying to go after you. They're literally using their little tongues and licking your sweat. None of them make honey. Uh, the honeybee is actually a European uh, bee. It, it's not a native bee. And speaking of the tongues before, this is some pictures about of tongues, just because I, I think it's really neat. So this is a bumblebee coming into a flower. It's already got its tongue out and ready to get that nectar. Some bees have long tongues, others have short tongues. And so that dictates the type of flower that they're going to use, um, a more open flower for um, short tongue bees. Here's a little picture of a little short tongue bee, small bee. Um, that's it. it's its tongue coming out right there to get the nectar. Now, some of them, you know, they might, uh, they're called nectar robbers, and they say, well, I'm not going to let my little short tongue um, exclude me from this long tubular flower. And they'll go up to the top of the flower and chew a little hole in it and stick their tongue in there and get the nectar that way. 
A bee goes through complete metamorphosis. Um, the female bee lays an egg and it lays that egg on a pollen ball so that when the larva um, hatches out of the egg, it has its food. So it's, it's like hatching onto a big buffet and it spends its time and eats that. And once it's finished its little buffet, it turns into a pupa and then it stays in that stage for a while and eventually emerges as an adult. Pollen collection. Bees collect pollen because they're furry. So they have something called scopa hairs, mostly on their legs, sometimes on their abdomens. And that's where they collect the, the pollen from. Here's a bee just swimming in the pollen, getting lots of um, pollen grains on its fur. Other bees like bumblebees and honeybees actually have something called a corbicula and it's a little hollow depression in their leg where they, they groom the pollen off of themselves and down and they use a little bit of nectar and they pack it into those onto their legs and so you can see that here. So bee fly or wasp, it can be hard to identify them sometimes. Some um, so. Flies have very stubby antennae. You can't even see it on this one. They have big eyes that come right up over the head. And um, they only have one pair of wings. And they tend to not have a waist. They're kind of chunky. But some of them can be quite hairy. So it's easy to confuse whether they're a bee or not. This is a bee. You will see that they, they this one's quite furry. This is a little uh, green metallic sweat bee. Uh, they have eyes on the side of their heads. The, the eyes don't come up over the top of the head. They have long antenna and they have two pairs of wings. Bees are vegetarian and that's why they're collecting pollen. Wasps, on the other hand, are hairless because they, they have, um, they're, they're hunters. So they, they need to be lean and mean to uh, catch their prey. They have a thread like waist. They have a long tapered body. They have two, like bees, they have a long antenna. They have the eyes on the side of their head and two wings. Now this is kind of a very interesting thing that only certain bees can do. It's called buzz pollination. Some flowers, they have their um, pollen, it's locked inside of pores. Uh, and they, that has to be actively released. And the only way that pollen can be released is with this buzz pollination. And so some bees can do this. They come in and they actually detach their wings from their flight muscles and they grab hold of the flower and they, they vibrate this, this flight muscle. And that's called sonication or buzz pollination. And that releases the pollen from these these pores in the plant. And so blueberries, cranberries, tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers, they all have to have this buzz pollination in order to be pollinated. And so if you don't have bumblebees and carpenter bees, mining bees, and sweat bees, your blueberries and cranberries, you're not gonna get them. So we really need these native bees. And I was watching some bumblebees do it the other day and they, they come in and they you'll hear them go zzz, in the in the flower and that's that's what they're doing so i want to teach you just go over a few different bees that you might see in your garden and and the reason why i think when we put a name to something we tend to care about it a little bit more so if we know that there's this little carpenter bee living in this area i'm less likely to pave it over um, this is a male serotina bee you see this little inverted t mark on its face um, that lets you know you can understand you can identify that bee. This is a leaf cutter bee. It's the only uh, family of bees that carry it has scopa hairs on its abdomen. And so if you see a bee that's carrying uh, pollen on the abdomen, you know it belongs to the genus Megachile. And they also have a wide head to accommodate uh, large jaws. This is another Megachile uh, genus. You can see that it has scopa hairs and the pollen on its abdomen. And leaf cutter bees are why you have, you might notice on some of your plants, a little um, half moon shape cut out of your leaf. And that's awesome because it means you have leaf cutter bees in your garden. And they are so cute. 
they they come along and they just they they chew and they kind of curl themselves around as they chew that um, that leaf, and then they fly off with it and they take that little bit of leaf and they roll it into a cone and they they put it into their nest and line their nest with it. This is a large carpenter bee. You can tell from this little mark on its face here that this is a male. And you might see them in your garden. They're very territorial uh, with other bees. So they kind of just hover around in the garden and zoom around and chase off other bees. Uh, these are some more sweat bees, Agapostamon. And of course, our bumblebees, which uh, belong to the genus Bombus, which I think is a fantastic name for them. And uh, this is one going into my hairy beard tongue flowers. And they, they literally kind of grab it and pull it on like a hat to get themselves down inside there. Uh, so creating a bee habitat, we want to plant native and a diversity of flower types. Um, Bees need nectar and pollen, and some flowers only provide pollen, some don't have a lot of pollen, they have more nectar. So if you're only planting one type of flower, you're gonna miss some of their key dietary needs. And some bees only forage for a short time and others forage the entire summer. So if you only have a limited amount of bloom, you're again not going to be getting that diversity of bees. So if you imagine you're a bee coming in, uh, which flower you're gonna choose? You're probably going to avoid the peony because it's gonna be a lot of work to get into the center of that plant and there might not even be pollen or nectar in there for you and you've expended a lot of energy. Whereas the lance leaf coreopsis, this nice bright daisy flower, it's got an easy landing pad, you're in, you're out, you've got your pollen and your, your nectar with limited amount of energy. Uh, you want to provide areas for nesting. We want some messy areas in our garden, so leave some logs, leave some leaf piles, that's where they nest. Uh, this is a little tiny carpenter bee, um, Serotina, and if you leave your stems, so in the fall I always leave all my plant stems standing because there's other bees that nest in it through the fall. And then in the spring, I cut them down and cut them kind of roughly so that the bees can, it's kind of broken, they can get into it, but cut them about eight to 10 inches high and, and then leave, leave about eight to 10 inches standing. And uh, take that bundle of cut stems and just put them somewhere in your garden because there might be nesting bees from the fall in there and they need to emerge. Um, and then these little bees will move in and they, they excavate the pith and, uh, you've provided nesting for them. Also leave some bare earth areas. 70% of our native bees are ground nesters. And here's a little bee, I never could identify it because it never really popped out of its hole long enough. But you can see the dirt just flying. It was digging away like crazy and building a nest. So it's pretty cool when you get out there and you start looking what you can see. And a lot of bees can't travel very far. They, they can't fly long distances, so they want to nest close to their food source, so make sure you have nesting areas next to your flowers or your vegetables. And here's another little bee home, um, and it was created by this little bee, a cellophane bee. And you can see they have this heart-shaped face, and that's one of their key identifying factors. And just a little bit about bee hotels, those are made for um, um, mason bees that nest in these tubes. If you can't commit to cleaning it, don't get one uh, right off the bat because it's if you can't look after it, then it's no good. Um, and you want to make sure that the holes are at least six inches deep. And the reason for this is because bees, when they lay their eggs, they um, lay a certain, they can determine the sex of the egg when they lay them. So they lay a certain number of female eggs in proportion to male eggs. And they lay the females at the back of the nest and the males to the front of the nest. Um, partly because, no offense to the men out there, the males are more dispensable than the females. Um, and so if there's a predator or anything, they're more likely to get the males than the females, which are at the back of the nest. But if the hole isn't long enough, they're going to, um, they may still go in, but they may lay, 
the wrong proportion of male to female eggs, and that can throw off um, a community of bees. And now we're just going to move on to our butterflies, because who doesn't love to see butterflies in our garden? Um, this is the eastern tiger swallowtail. A little bit about uh, butterflies. Uh, their order is Lepidoptera, and I'm terrible with my Latin, so excuse me. Um, and that interpreted is scaly wings. If you've ever seen a butterfly wing, it's little scales, and they're very pretty. Uh, they, too, do a complete metamorphosis from egg to larva to a chrysalis uh, with the pupa and to a butterfly, and it's quite a miracle. Um, try and see it if you can. Uh, females lay hundreds to thousands of eggs in their lifetimes, and caterpillars are ravenous little creatures, and they eat quite a lot, and they eat so much, they do shed their skin, so they have stages, and those stages are called instars. Here's a monarch instar after it's just shed its skin, and you'll see its, its um, antenna are very flat, and they will actually eat their skin. So bringing butterflies into the garden, you have to have host plants for the caterpillars because you can't have butterflies without a caterpillar. So in order to have your butterfly, your beautiful butterflies in the garden, you have to have somewhere for the caterpillar to be. And what is a host plant? A host plant is a plant that a butterfly can lay its eggs on. It's the only plant that the larva can feed on. Um, so milkweed for monarchs, a lot of people know that. Uh, the common milkweed can be a bit weedy in your garden. Um, so these are two species of milkweed that the monarchs love as well, and they're much better behaved in your garden, swamp milkweed and butterfly milkweed. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of different butterflies and caterpillars that you might see in your garden and the host plants for them so you can plant those. Um, if you want black swallowtails in your garden, uh, carrot family, so carrot, dill, parsley, queen anne's lace, these will all attract the butterflies or to lay their eggs. And we've always had these on our carrots. They've never destroyed our entire carrot population or anything. So we've always had lots to, of carrots to enjoy. This is Pearly Everlasting. Um, the American lady lays its eggs on it. Now I will say that these, these little voracious um, caterpillars here, they, they will pretty much make it look like you're never going to have Pearly Everlasting again. But it does bounce back, but it looks pretty awful for a while. So just don't be alarmed by that. See the beauty in it because you know you're feeding this um, caterpillar. Skippers, uh, they're really sweet little, there's so many different types, um, but a lot of them nest or uh, lay their eggs on native grasses, so good to have those around. This is Milbert tortoiseshell at the top and um, Red Admiral at the bottom, and their host plant is stinging nettles. Uh, stinging nettles do sting if you grab a hold of them, so I would suggest planting that plant in a pot in your garden so that um, you know where it is and, and you don't get stung by it. And uh, this is the Great Spangled Fritillaria. The host plant is um, violets and beautiful butterfly, really stunning. It's the first time I've had it in my garden last year. This is the Baltimore's checker spot. Host plant is the white turtle head. I have yet to see this butterfly, but it is uh, quite gorgeous. So I've got my fingers crossed. And this is the giant swallowtail butterfly. Uh, it's actually predominantly would be down south more into uh, like the Point Pelee Lake Erie area, but we're start starting to see them come up into the, the York region, Durham region area. Um, hop tree is one of the host plants. Again, that's a tree that's predominantly um, from um, Point Pelee Lake Erie area. Um, but it's been growing well here. I have it in my garden, and last year I had um, a giant swallowtail, and a lot of people have had them. So um, whether this is an example of climate change, I'm not sure, but they do seem to be heading north. And now Anne's going to take over for a few minutes and talk a little bit about how she's raised butterflies and her experiences with butterflies and moths. Take it away, Anne. Okay. All right, so I don't know 
I you can't see me, can you? Can can people see me? I can no, see your screen. You. you can see me? Okay. Can you see what I'm showing you? Can you see can I see myself? No. Okay. I have in my hand, and I don't know whether you can see it or not, but I have a, a monarch here, a monarch caterpillar. Um, I think what we'll do is post pictures of, of my props, my creatures, on our Facebook page afterwards. So I'll just tell you about some of these caterpillars that I have raised. Um, be careful what you're squishing in the garden, because what you're squishing may turn into some absolutely beautiful moths. Um, this is a cecropia moth, absolutely lovely, very big. And I raised quite a lot of those last year from, from eggs through the caterpillars. And they spent the winter in the back shed, in the cold and the dark, in their cocoons. And they emerged last week. So they spent, it took them a year to go through their life cycle. And they've just, just come out. So they're absolutely lovely. Um, next one, Brenda. Next slide, Brenda. Yeah. Okay. There. Can you see it? Yes, I can see it now. And that's a polyphenol okay. moth. That is also an absolutely beautiful one. You can see how big it is because it's compared to a hand there. And these also overwintered. They were starving hungry creatures all year. They were not that easy to raise because there were a lot of them and they eat a lot. Now, some of them, some of these caterpillars look quite strange. The Cecropia caterpillar looks just like something out of a Disney movie. It is blue and yellow and has red spots. It is very large, and as you can see, it really drags its leaf around while it's eating it. That's a very large one. The giant swallowtail caterpillar that's up there on the right, it looks exactly like bird droppings. This is to prevent other creatures, from birds, from wanting to eat it quite ugly looking. What is that on its head, you wonder? It is called a osmaterium. And if you make this caterpillar angry, if you irritate it, it will shoot out these, these red spikes out of its forehead and they smell terrible. It spits out a horrible smell. And that's its protection from being eaten by other creatures. Um, so they're really interesting. To raise the swallowtail caterpillars I found on a rue plant. Uh, these are polyphemus, polyphemus caterpillars, and they really do get quite large. These, this one has his head up, and you can see they're, they're interesting creatures to raise. They were eating Norway maple. The cecropias eat lilac. Caterpillars are fussy. The tree that they hatch on is the tree that they would like to continue to eat for the rest of their life. Or the same type of tree. Okay, Brenda. Next one, please. Yeah, it is now. Yes, yes. So, in order to get some butterfly habitat, you need to provide them with with host plants, nectar plants. It's much better for them if you have the same kind of plant, several several plants of the same kind. You know, for instance, if you've got zinnias, which they absolutely love have a large clump of zinnias, not just one. That way they can flitter from, from one plant to another and it's really easy to plant. They like sheltered areas and they like areas for puddling, a little bit of water, a little bit of mud. You'll find them puddling around in mud or water. They love um, decomposing fruit. I think Brenda's got that slide here. You've got decomposing fruit, Brenda. There you go. You can put out um, decomposing fruit in a in a bag, the kind of bag that you get lemons in, or other fruits like that. Uh, you can hang it outside on a hook, and the butterflies will come and and devour that. They really enjoy that. This was an Easter karma butterfly. Maria de Costa is an amazing butterfly woman, and she gave us that one. Transforming from a caterpillar to a monarch is just the most amazing process you could ever see. A caterpillar will grow and grow, changing its skin five times, and then it will hang upside down in a J shape. And a few hours later, its skin splits, 
and inside is a chrysalis. And this chrysalis is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful green. And typically it has gold spots around the top of it. It will stay as a chrysalis for about two weeks, just hanging. You can see that it's attached itself to something here with, with a little pad of silk. It makes a little pad of silk, shoots out the, the little black thing, goes into the pad of silk, and then it hangs there for a couple of weeks. And next one, please. And as it becomes mature over the course of a couple of weeks, you gradually can see inside the leaf, the wings are forming. So inside this case, it is completely remaking itself. It becomes liquid and completely reforms its insides. It becomes more and more transparent. You can see the wings. You know it's going to be coming out very soon. And you'd stop doing everything. You just wait and watch. And mm -hmm. as it emerges, it splits that case. When it comes out, it has a huge abdomen and tiny little wings. And over the next couple of hours, it pumps fluid from it into it from its abdomen into the wings, pumps the wings up bigger and bigger and flaps and flaps. And once they're completely ready and large the wings are ready for it to fly it is amazing i hope you get to see it someday it's well worth raising a few if you find some eggs or caterpillars raise a few of them feed the milkweed um, if it's a monarch if not feed them the appropriate leaves and you get to see the miracle okay we i think we are done brenda all right, thank you, Anne. That's that it. All right, and just a little nod to other pollinators. There are other pollinators out there. Um, Anne showed us some moths. Obviously, when they visit flowers as well, um, they move some pollen for, from flower to flower. Ants, bats, even birds and beetles are all um, pollinators, and. Just a, a quick little thing that I, I thought was really interesting. I read today, uh, you know, this this idea of everything being connected. Uh, beetles in general, we're not too happy sometimes to see beetles, but I I had some beetles in my garden that I didn't know what they were, and and I did get rid of them because they were devouring uh, one of my plants. But then I've just read that they actually um, are parasitic to bees, and so I was like, well, I I don't want them around. However, when I continue reading, when you have those beetles in your garden, it actually indicates that you have a healthy um, system of bees, that you have a healthy community of bees and a variety of bees, because those beetles wouldn't be there if you didn't have a good community of bees. So, you know, that that's how everything's interconnected and and i should be happy to see those beetles because it means my bee population is is uh, thriving so um and just one last comment about uh habitat remember obviously that that butterflies bees and and pesticides don't mix so you know put away those those poisons and see beauty in in all the imperfection in the world uh, which really is perfect in its own way. Um, I'll just leave you with a little photo of a monarch on um, an echinacea pale purple coneflower. Brenda, can I, I forgot to show them my cocoons. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, you go ahead and do that. Can, can you see what I'm, <laughs> can you see what I'm holding up? I can't see what I'm holding up. Can you? Uh, yes, and we can kind of see you it in your screen. See it. Okay. If, if you there's came anyone, up, yeah, oh, go sorry, Raymond. go ahead. Raymond, I was going to say, if there's anyone who wants to uh, enlarge Anne's screen, you can click, uh, hover over her, and just click the pin, and you will see a full screen. Okay. If you are out in the woods, out in the forest, and you saw this, what would you think? You would probably take no notice of it, kick it out of the way. You wouldn't realize that this is a cocoon for a Cecropia or a Polyphemus. And if you were to put this in a dark, cold place over the winter, you may very well get a beautiful Cecropia or Polyphemus moth. 
Their cocoons are fascinating, strange, unusual. It's amazing to see them wrap themselves up in, the, in all of this silk and wrap themselves up in leaves. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Anne. Um, so just to finish up, um, when I'm planting in my garden, I, I look at each plant and, and I consider whether it has ecological value and not all of them, like that peony pitcher, you know, I'm still gonna have my, my grandmother's peonies in my garden, but if I'm planting something new or I have a space, I'm gonna turn to my native plants more often because they, they have um, a big ecological value um, because they've co-evolved with our native pollinators. And I wanna make sure that the plant I'm putting in is worth the space. And I think uh, we're just about done. I just want to thank um, Raymond and uh, Stephanie for making this webinar possible. And also a little shout out to Charlotte de Keyser. Um, she was a speaker at one of our meetings as well on bees. And I've been emailing her and sending her photos of bees and she's been helping me with the identification. And check out her blog called beewashing.com. It's quite interesting. Uh, just going on. Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority reached out to us and wanted us to let you know about their um, grant that they have. So that's something to check out. They will uh, kick in 50% of a project up to $1,000. So it's a good way to, if you have a project or have some land that you want to turn into a pollinator garden, you might be able to get some help through them. I've listed these again. Uh, Raymond, I believe this is going to be uh, sent out in a little package on um, your Facebook page, I believe. Correct. Um, okay, perfect. So I've got some native plants um, that I particularly like. I've divided them into different areas of what kind of community you might want to create depending on what environment you have. And some resources, I really like this, the first book listed here, uh, Bees and Identification, a Native Plant Forage Guide by Heather Holm, it's excellent. Uh, the ROM Field Guide to Butterflies is really wonderful as well. And I've starred uh, this website here, the Conservation Halton. It has some excellent um, loads or PDFs that you can you can upload and um, that list plants and, and what their requirements are and what, what host plant they are, that kind of thing. It's really excellent. And a few more just general information websites to go to. And for purchasing native plants, um, I have gone quite often to most of my plants for my native plant garden came from Claremont native plants. They're excellent. Also the North American Native Plant Association um, in normal times as well. They have a um, plant sale. And if you want to discover other nurseries around the Halton Master Gardeners, uh, they have a list of native plant um, nurseries in Ontario. And that's that's the end of me. Perfect. Uh, thank you again so much. Thank uh, you so much, Gardeners. everyone, uh, for joining you. in. Do we, have uh, I, we did have a couple of questions uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, I think, let's see if we head back to. Uh, I have them, Ramon, if you want me okay. to share them. Perfect. Thank you, Elaine. Okay. okay, so first we have a question from Jessica about leaf cutter bee houses. She wanted to know if she needs to replace them every year. I have an I have a very old one. I'm nervous about getting rid of it. Right. That's a great question. Um, not every year that you have to get um, to clean it, but it should be every other year or so. Um, that I'm just trying 
trying to think on that one slide um, with the resources, the uh, Exerces Society um, website has a lot of good information about how to look after uh, Mason Bee homes. But yes, they, they do need to be cleaned out, um, you know, every couple of years. Okay, thank you. Next, we have a question from Christine. Uh, what are native plants for painted lady butterflies? Fairly everlasting. Um, uh, the painted lady actually doesn't lay on like the pearly everlasting, and that's that's the that's American the lady. lady. It's kind of confusing because they, they sound the same. Um, the painted lady likes burdocks. Um, that would be on your, if, if you download that PDF, the Halton list, it would be on there. Um, but the larva for that, I believe, is um, some of the burdock family. And in general, most, any sort of um, native plant that, that is flowering, the um, it's going to provide nectar, et cetera, for, um, for the butterflies. Okay, and, and next some question of your annuals was, are very good as well. Sorry, Brenda, I cut you. Go ahead. Uh, next question okay. is from Albors. Uh, with climate change being sort of inevitable now, is it okay to introduce native plants from further south? Example, given Point Pelé. Yes. That's a fantastic yeah. question. Um, Yes, yes, we're starting to see um, that they're um, they're advising that even so that that those native those species from further south uh, will maybe be more adapted as the climate um, warms up. So that thing like the hop tree, the Kentucky coffee tree, those are the all things tree. that you can bring up from here. Tulip tree, yeah. yeah. York Region is planting more tulip trees just for that reason. Okay, next question is from Christine. Uh, what happens if a chrysalis falls? Can it survive if not reattached? Sometimes they do, not very often. Not. Yeah, they, they sometimes do survive. It's not, it's not a good situation. Um, if it's possible to reattach them, you can, if you're very, very careful, you can reattach them with a tiny drop of hot glue if you have a, something suitable to reattach it to. Um, they will sometimes survive, but they must have something that they can climb up immediately so that they're going to be able to open their wings. It's not a good situation, but it, they can sometimes survive. Okay. I used, I, found one that had, I had found one that had fallen and um, um, I used a little bit of um, oh, dental floss to tie it on um, yeah. to a little twig. Yeah. Okay, next question. Uh, it, oh, interesting subject from Catherine. Will it help to provide water source of some kind for pollinators, especially specifically for bees here? Uh, yes, it's a good idea. Um, you can do the same as you would for the butterflies as well. A small, just a very shallow dish and you can fill it with little stones and then fill some put some water in that and um, then they can they can rest on the stones and get the water from between the stones without obviously drowning. So very good, good idea. Okay, uh, another question about butterflies here. What kind of fruits are good for uh, butterflies? Oh, they like bananas and oranges, pretty much anything that's going nice and rotten. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> and uh, we have one last question from uh, Jody. Are there any bylaws in East Glenberry that prevent you from transitioning your front yard into a pollinator or prairie garden? Mm. 
I am not aware of that, Anne. I don't know yes, if you know. Yes, it's um, if it's being well maintained, it's probably okay. When you get into trouble, is if as if you say you're turning it into a prairie garden, but in fact you're just neglecting it. And in that case, in that case, they will come along and they will mow it down. And I, there's particular, particularly in the last couple of years in in Sharon, there was a property that was not being maintained, and and it was very distressing because there were chrysalids and so forth there, and and they did get mowed down, but. They do have rules about how tall the grass can be. People have allergies. And so if it's going to be a prairie garden, it needs to be a well-maintained one so that you can justify it being a garden. And if I can add uh, something, because I've uh, actually checked with the town uh, on those kind of subjects, and you can't block the view if your house is on a corner, let's say. So you have to, right. to have a clear line of view for um, people who are driving their cars. And you can do herbaceous perennials because sometimes in East Goldenberry, part of your uh, front yard isn't actually yours, it's the town's. And uh, oh. you can't do anything that would require, or you could get in trouble, but uh, yeah, anything that uh, that's not herbaceous, meaning that uh, anything that's not uh, dying flat to the ground during the winter and coming up again in the spring. But uh, yeah. otherwise, uh, yeah, the, and they can come in and dig that part of the yard uh, at any point in time without notice. So if you don't mind, uh, if it's not that precious uh, plant that you that you cherish, I think I would do it. But uh, for sure, you can address that question with the town. They're very uh, they're very responsive by emails. Uh, yeah, and that is our last question. Um, thank you again uh, to the East Glenberry Gardeners. Uh, thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Brenda. And thank you, Anne, for uh, sharing your expertise and experience. Uh, just a reminder that we will be posting the recording of uh, today's uh, webinar on our social media channels, and I believe it will be going up on the East Glenberry Gardeners YouTube channel as well. And all those lovely resources that Brenda shared near the end we will be uh, posting that to our Facebook page as well. So keep an eye out for that. 